I think like in the Little Bit Planet community, one of the uh, one of the main pieces of music that you can post that lots of people are quite fond of is uh, the the gardens theme. Um, I just I just wanted to know a bit general about that theme sure. and the making of it. Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing to note is that um, I wrote that with Matt, and actually um, Matt was the one who who started that whole thing. So um, it's point I don't take <laughs> all the credit for it. Um, Matt Clark was the main composer on the project uh, who wrote the majority of the music. I wrote a bunch of music and uh, Daniel Pemberton wrote the intro movie music. Um, and the, the other music that's in the in the game that's from Daniel, uh, he didn't actually write the project. That's stuff we licensed from his back catalogue of uh, TV music. Uh, anyway, that's just some uh, wider context about the different composers in the project. Um, with the garden specifically, yeah, so the challenge with that one was that the sort of behind the scenes, the the way I thought about all the the music or, or what all the interactive music, where you can change the you know the, the relative volume levels of all the different um, parts in there, so that people can customize music to fit their levels was the thinking. Um, the challenge for each of those was to come up with something that fitted each sort of theme, and for so again behind the scenes, the way we internally at Media Molecule viewed all that stuff was um, that. Each, each theme had a very specific location, like a country theme. And so for the gardens one, it was uh, basically like an English country garden was the was what, what, how we referred to it. So hence the, the, the garden wall with the snail shells and all the rest of it. So it's literally like a very typical sort of Victorian two up, two down garden with a little brick wall in it. Um, and so, but then the challenge there is like, well, what is the sound of, <laughs> of that? Um, and that was a tough that was actually the toughest brief out of all of the the countries because maybe as a british person it's quite easy to be really ignorant about other cultures and to sort of stereotype what they might sound like um but it's a lot harder to stereotype your own culture and i think it's it's, in, it's just interesting like there's as a scot there's things that i think i could do to sort of stereotype scotland but it's something i actually really struggle to do in terms of stereotyping england um, and I think that's probably a thing that all British people would struggle with, like, what is the sound of England? <laughs> and it's not got, like, a really obvious point of reference. There's things like, you know, like, you could say, like, the Beatles, but the sound of the Beatles isn't the sound of England, it's the sound of the Beatles. So it's, like, it's just tricky to really sort of hone and distill that down into a tight music brief and bit of music direction. So there was quite a lot of, yeah, um gesticulating about that but the things that I sort of honed in on was it'd be nice to have uh, a bit of for me I wanted to like capture a range of stuff so there was like I wanted to get a little bit of like a 60s or 70s retro vibe in there and I wanted to have like a string cortex I felt like that represented like upper class <laughs> sort of British just trying to get a bit of the class system in there um, <laughs> and yeah I forget the rest of it but basically I wrote this brief and I gave it to Matt and I was like, you know, and that's the way I sort of I work with composers when I'm an audio director is to give them parameters within which to work. So it's not to say, tell them like exactly what to write, but to say, you know, here's the thinking behind this, here's some of the instrumentation that I think makes sense, um, you know, and yeah, and here's the kind of the, the, the tempo and da, 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 da. give them all this information, then just let them do their thing. And the first thing Matt came back with was literally a like a an arrangement of like a rock arrangement of in an english country garden you know the do 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 in an english country garden he came back with this like thing with like this like so it was retro because it sounded kind of like a 70s kids tv theme um but it was too um a it was too too rock which and this was the first level in the game so the music had to be kind of <laughs> perfect uh, and it didn't feel like it gelled, it was too rocky and like that was just almost too aggressive. Uh, and also, I guess the English Country Garden thing felt a bit too like, I don't actually know if that's a kid's tune or if it's a, like a church hymn or what, like I can't remember what the original context for that is, but it didn't feel like it fitted the game very well. Um, so we sent that one back and we're like, sorry Matt, <laughs> it's not working. Um, and I can't remember if I then gave him more explicit direction or, or what, but he so went back to drawing forward and he came back with um, an early version of that track and he'd actually based it on, I think it's a uh, Pachelbel's Canon. So the chord, uh, 
progression is the same as Packer Bale's canon. Um, and again, that was sort of tying into this like uh, sort of upper class kind of <laughs> thing. I, I don't know what it is about Packer Bale's which it isn't English, but it's it's just got that sort of uh, class, classy, the connotations of classical music being sort of uh, slightly elitist and all this. So it was taking that as its starting point, but then made it kind of more of a sort of contemporary pop thing. And uh, and that worked a lot better, um, but there it there was there was it wasn't quite wasn't quite done yet it wasn't quite right uh, and for whatever reason I I got into the habit at that point of Matt um, had some really good ideas and took it to a certain way down the line and then I would sort of jump in it and basically do some music production to sort of push it a little bit more towards uh, where I thought it needed to be to fit the game so. That's when I added things like the, um, yeah. So I did the, I wrote this, the string part uh, for that, um, redid the bass part, um, added the guitar part, um, and you know Matt had hired this amazing uh, flute player, uh, Pete Long. I think the chaps, I might have got that wrong, but I think that was the chap's name, and um, and he basically just improvised the whole thing like matt said so something a bit like this and then the guy was like yeah i know exactly what you mean and then you know did this amazing solo in particular but he i think he's a he's a he's a jazz you know flautist uh and flute's not even his main instrument i think he might be a sax player but he's obviously just a super talented chap did this amazing solo and like that is like you know i can't take any credit for that whatsoever i had nothing to do with it um but i think that's obviously the standout element of that track and it wouldn't be anything without that and so i think that just speaks a lot about the uh, importance of um, what a live performer and a, an amazing world-class musician like that can can bring to a track, because um, without it, it would it would be nice, but you know it just wouldn't have elevated that to that like whoa, this is cool level. <laughs> so once you know, and that was there from the beginning, you know, all credit to Matt and to Pete. Um, so it was just the stuff that I did was really just sort of you know a bit of production basically. Um, but yeah, the, the all together, the thing just sort of worked really well so it was you know that's obviously the intention when you're doing these things is for it to be great but you never quite know what you're going to end up with until you get there um but despite sort of the the rocky start on that track uh, with the, the first version of it it ended up being brilliant and uh yeah i i can see why the community you know have a soft spot for that one because it it just does seem to sort of encapsulate the project uh really nicely so it's good to hear yeah it definitely it's it's definitely one of the uh, one of the fans' kind of favorite pieces. It's like the amount of uh, the amount of remixes and uh, it's, yeah, <laughs> especially on YouTube, it's yeah. quite a few. And when the when PlayStation had their concert at the Albert Hall a few years ago, um, it was that track from Little Big Planet that um, my friend Jim Fowler, who's an amazing composer and his own right, but he orchestrated all the different tracks for the London Philharmonic, and that yeah, that was a track he, <laughs> he chose for them to do, which is a difficult one for an orchestra to, to pull off because it's so jazzy, but it was, yeah, it was really cool to hear that, the small part that I played in bringing that track to life, it was nice to hear that being played in the Royal Albert Hall, it was a pretty sort of cool career moment. Yeah, I, I can bet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, should we move on to the next question? Yeah, go for it. Um, what was the most fun sound to make in the game and why? Um, so, so I mean, like, fun is not really a word I used to describe what I do in a way, so it's difficult to sort of answer that one specifically. But I think um, I change it to the sound I'm proudest of or think most fondly about. It's a while ago now as well, because this is you know, fifteen years ago. We're talking sixteen years yeah. ago. We're talking about. Um, but the one that I look back on with the most sort of nostalgia probably is the. Uh, like the, the bubble collect and prize collect sounds, uh, oh sorry, points collect sounds, like you know, the small point bubbles and then the larger prize bubbles, which are those where you collect the, the different, you know, things that you can build your levels with and all that materials, music, etc. Um, and so, interestingly, certainly the points bubbles, maybe maybe the prize bubbles, I can't remember, but I worked on those as part of my like job test for Media Molecule before I actually worked on the game properly. Um, as part of that process, they sent me a little sort of one minute, one and a half minute, however long, uh, bit of gameplay footage. Um, and I just had to sort of put sounds in it to sort of show them what I could do and what I would do with the project, etc. And I can't remember, I think that happened 
I can't remember if it happened before the job interview or if I did that after the job interview. Not that it really matters, but it's just trying to get my timeline right in my head. But anyway, um, so that's where those sounds, certainly the first version of those sounds came from, was just without much in the way of direction from them, just uh, doing what I thought they needed to sound like. And then um, they're quite true. They're important sounds because obviously you hear them all the time. <laughs> so they're important to get right and so they need to be satisfying. Um, and yeah, I can't even remember particularly how how I did it. I do remember that when you collect a prize bubble, there's this sound that sounds a bit like a chicken almost. Uh, it, it's hard to <laughs> it's hard to. I was about to do a, a impression of what it sounds like. It's a bit like a <laughs> sort of sound, um, and that was intentional. Like I I viewed the uh, prize bubbles in particular a bit like eggs so it was a bit almost like a gacha machine where you get like a little see-through plastic ball with uh, some plastic tat in it <laughs> that you're going to collect and obviously I think they're meant to be more like bubbles that you blow from a you know a bubble wand because they've got that kind of rainbow like quality yeah. to them but obviously it's abstract because it's gameplay nonsense but um so again it's going back to that sort of childhood thing so it's meant to be like bubbles but they also had that gacha thing going on. So I was like, okay, so like bubbles don't make a sound, so that's not got any legs. So it's th- I was, that's why I think I was drawn more towards the gacha things. It's like, okay, they're made of plastic, um, but they're also a bit like eggs. So I think that's where they like the chicken. <laughs> the chicken thing comes from is it's meant to be a bit more like egg-like. It's almost like the egg has been laid or something like that, even though you collected it. It doesn't make any sense, but sometimes when you're working on a sound like that, you just need a little, especially when it's abstract, you just need to find a little something to help you make the sound. So for me, that concept of an egg being laid or or, or, or whatever was in there. So that sound's got little bits of like plastic in it. It's got, um, and that, that chicken sound, what I'm calling the chicken sound is actually, it was like, it was a sound effect of like a witch laughing. But for some reason, if you just took one little cackle of the <laughs> of a <laughs> it like it just ended up sounding a bit like a chicken. Uh, so anyway, that's a bit of a weird one. But again, I just sort of I'm really proud of those sounds because I think they sort of they are satisfying. They do what they're meant to do, and you know I've never heard anyone complain about them. I'd be like, God, oh, I just every time that sound plays, I want to stab my ears or whatever. You know, it's just it just works, and um, that's uh, a job well done <laughs> from my perspective. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's definitely a satisfying sound. It's like it it really yes. <laughs> <laughs> it it definitely yeah because like you said, it's constant that you hear it. you hear it constantly. It's uh, the levels are filled with them. So uh, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. So the next question I have to ask is, what was the trickiest sound to make in the game and why? <laughs> So, yeah, so I don't, I, I don't really remember sort of, you know, really struggling with anything like, like there was nothing where I like, you know, just couldn't do it and had to sort of leave it and come back to wherever. wherever. Um, but I think the sounds or the, the, the group of sounds that took the most effort and just the sheer amount of work that went into them was probably the physics audio. Um, partly from like a technology point of view, um, audio programmer Matt Willis and myself, up until that point, the way um physics audio systems worked in game but the only sort of approach that i was aware of is that you have a big spreadsheet where you list every either every object in the game like a bus timetable you know where it's like you know coke can down one side and like you know whatever the other side and then every time a two objects interact you you enter into the spreadsheet what sound should play um so it's just like a, a way of manually specifying what to do and little big planet had so many objects that that just was like looked like a terrible horrible <laughs> horrible way to do it and that might have even been what i asked matt to do and he was just like i don't want to do that <laughs> or or i was or he'd said let's do that and i said i don't want to do that i can't remember which way around it was but for whatever reason um we didn't want to do that which is good because that's just like a i can see why people did it that way maybe when games were a bit simpler but with little big planet just yeah it's that sounded like a pain in the in the bum basically and thinking about the you know, expanding the project going forward with DLC and all the rest of it, having to update that every time you add a new object, they just sounded painful. So, 
So we start to think about, well, if we're not going to do it that way, how can we sort of automate it to some degree uh, where it just sort of magically works? And then um, we started talking about sort of rules for how the object should interact. And um, I think the, the, the main moment, I used to have this big red sofa in my room at Leading Molecule and Matt was sitting on it. And uh, for some reason, I also had a baseball bat. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, I can't remember if that was mine or if it was someone else's in the studio. But um, I I should remember we were like, all right, so what well, what happens when two sounds interact? And like hitting the sofa <laughs> with the baseball bat and being like, this is a hard object, but when we hit the sofa, we don't hear the baseball bat, we hear the sofa. I was like, why is that? I was like, well, this is a hard object, that's a soft object. So we start to sort of create these rules. It's like, if we give each object like a hardness value, obviously it's got its own sound. If it's something made of metal, it has a metal sound on it. But if this is like a hardness value of 10 and that's a hardness value of one, then we'll only, if it's, also the rule is if, it, if the hardness value is less than the other one, then you hear the, 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 the softer one. And so we start to create this sort of rule set for what to do and the more and then you put it in the game and it sounded good but then occasionally you hear something's like that doesn't sound right why doesn't that sound right you realize that oh these things are similar hardness levels so they both need to play and so you come up with all these little edge cases to cope with it all and, uh, and that was you know weeks and months of work basically to to get that to, to work and then once we had it to work i had to create all the content for all the different objects um which is good fun because i you know, had to record a bunch of stuff for that um the, the physics audio is the kind of thing you can't rely on a sound library for for the content because it's all quite bespoke. You don't get well, you can probably get physics audio library these these days because there's loads of boutique stuff available. But back in the the late two thousands, that wasn't an option, so you had to record stuff yourself, which is you know it's, it's good fun. Enjoy doing that. Um, so yeah, that was probably the, the trickiest, just in terms of the sheer amount of manpower and an investment of time and resources that went into that. But again, really, it's a when you're working in a game, you quite often are like, oh, I'm really into that. I'd like to do that. But actually, it's, it's a question of, is that the right thing to do? And because Little Big Planet is basically a physics sandbox, um, it was absolutely the right thing to do. And that's what justified spending all that time on that part of the audio experience. Um, I still remember, there's actually a video, I'm not sure if it's online. Um, there's a video of the, the, like the day we got physics audio working for the first time. Uh, and it's like, it's, it's a crappy little video. It was like filmed on my phone or something. Uh, from again late 2000s, so it's like probably tiny little 320 by 240 video or something like that. But it, it's just a, a video of the TV screen, and it's just like a bit of metal hitting a bit of wood. But it's like me, Matt Willis, and Alex Evans, maybe Dave Smith, all in my room just sort of laughing because it was just it was it was kind of surreal hearing the game brought to life because up to that point there was all this stuff moving, but none of it had any sound on it. So it didn't feel that concrete and all of a sudden it yeah it made us quite giddy i think because it sort of um really yeah it brought the game to life and um there was actually there was apprehension about it i remember like alex wasn't he was a bit skeptical about uh what me and matt were doing um alex had this crazy idea that we could score all the physics audio with just like a looping sound effect and like ramp it up in volume whenever stuff happened which um i think that was just like a Probably, yeah, probably just concerned that we were spending a lot of time on something that w wouldn't be worthwhile. But I knew that it that it, that it was, so I, so I pushed for it. Uh, and, and yeah, and credit to Alex, he sort of recognised that that was, um, you know, the right decision when we actually got it up and working. Um, and actually, I did take Alex's idea and use it because it's super esoteric and it's pretty subtle. I'm not sure most people would even notice it, but. So actually, I suppose hardcore Little Big Planet fans will have noticed it, but like when you get lots of collisions happening within the same frame, uh, that's being tracked by the audio system. So if, um, if basically if your level's exploding, you start to hear all these like chaos sounds. So there's like specific um, looping sound effects that happen when there's loads of impact. So if it's lots of wood, you start to hear creaks. If it's lots of sponge you start to hear like water dripping so it's quite abstract doesn't make any sense but they're they're just these or like when stones fall and you get like a, almost like an avalanche kind of sound starts to fade in uh, and it's all just based on the number of impacts that are happening per second and the thinking was well if there's a lot of impacts happening that doesn't sound very good because although we've got obviously each time you hear an impact is a slightly different sound effect but there's only like you know five to ten of those for any given material type 
Um, and when you hear a lot in the same time, it starts to sound quite repetitive and a bit fake. So by bringing in this abstract sort of looping sound, it just sort of introduces something that helps to mask the, the crapness of hearing the same sound effect repeated over and over. Uh, and again, in your average level, you don't hear that. Uh, it's we, Most people will hear it when things are going horribly wrong or if they're doing something really spammy and a bit sort of probably a bit naughty with their spawning of objects. Um, so again, super niche level of attention to detail. And I don't think I would have come up with that without Alex's sort of initially slightly rubbish suggestion to do all the physics audio in that way. But it's one of those ideas which it's got, there's like some good thinking in it somewhere, even if it's not applicable to the, the solution we were trying to solve, problem we were trying to solve initially. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's quite a good example of sort of uh, collaboration of sorts, <laughs> where, you know, someone's got an idea and it might not be quite the right proposal, but it's still a good idea. And, and you know, you shouldn't dismiss ideas just because they don't necessarily work. They, they, if you can find a way to make them work, they can often make uh, solutions better, uh, even if it's slightly adjacent to the original <laughs> proposal. So I, I I did actually, I so I, before before this interview, actually a couple of days ago or so, I went onto your YouTube channel and I okay. saw a video that you made about uh, mumbling voices. Oh, the gibberish, like yeah. Yeah, it, it posted like, what, 10 years ago? Yeah, it'd be a while ago. It was, <clears throat> yeah, so like, I mean, that video probably explains it better than I can uh, now, but if I think back to the first game in particular, the so the reason that we had the gibberish was, I mean, that's mainly down to me. I was quite <laughs> insistent upon it for a couple of reasons. The I think the main one, the most important one, is that um, we had this rule that we tried to abide by. We couldn't always do it, but generally speaking, we had this sort of principle, which was that we shouldn't be able to do anything that the community can, because that's just really frustrating for someone trying to build a level if they see that we were doing something that they can. So I think the biggest way that we were unable to do that in the first project would be like just, you know, that we were obviously writing music and putting it in the game, but the community couldn't write their own music and put it in the game. So that was like, that was a big frustration in the first project, but there just wasn't the, the time to to address that. Um, but with, um, it depends how you look at it, you could think about it as either the use of voice or the use of text, but it's basically communicating information to the player. Um, most people in the team, um, probably assumed and certainly wanted to have a lot more voice in the game. <clears throat> but I I was against it partly and probably not even primarily because of the yeah that, that, that conflict where if we were putting voice over in our game but we didn't have the ability to record and we didn't and um, we were particularly concerned in the first game I think with copyright infringement and having knowing that if we added the ability for people to record we'd worry the example we were always gave was like if we let people record stuff, they'll just record the Red Hot Chili Peppers and put it in the game and then we're in trouble. And so we just basically, that that's always what that conversation came back to is like, well, you want to have voiceover fine, you have to let people, the community have voiceover as well. But we can't have recording. So it's like, right, so we're not having voiceover in our game then. And that was, it's one of those things that just sort of annoyed people because they wanted it really badly, but I was really dogmatic about it. Um, and I always used the community aspect as the reason why <laughs> but the real reason why i didn't want it was that i knew that adding voiceover to all the badly written dialogue by the level designers would have like ruined the experience and that was the real reason but you can't use that uh, i maybe did say that a few times but i knew that that didn't hold as much water as the uh, community <laughs> sort of argument um and the reason for that is that um i've got a real passion for the use of use of voice that comes from my background, um, I'm not, I've never uh, worked in the theatre, but I just grew up in Edinburgh and my mum was a drama teacher. So uh, it's really privileged to, you know, have the world's largest international arts festival in the city that I grew up with. And in those days, in the 80s and 90s, uh, kids tickets for the for the, for the the fringe certainly uh, were, were, were dirt cheap, if not half price by, as standard. Not anymore, like everything else, everything's very expensive these days and highly commercialised, but um, yeah, I just I just grew up going to see world class theatre, and and you know voice and movement and physical theatre are the, the two main components of of good theatre, in my opinion. And uh, yeah, I just have a, a love of voice, and so games still, but even more so back then, didn't use voice uh, with much love or respect. It was really just a, a 
a crutch that was relied upon to communicate information to, 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 to players, <clears throat> which is a necessary evil, but it wasn't done with any, like I say, any love or skill or experience. And certainly the dialogue written, there was a lot of um, really talented, but ultimately very inexperienced uh, level designers at Media Molecule, people who'd never worked in games or on a game before. Um, and did an amazing job on the on the level design, but you know they were the ones who were like writing the little bits of text that would pop up around the level, and they were all very uh, utilitarian and saying you know like you know do this do that or they'd inject a little bit of flavour, but little little design considerations like every time you died you'd go back and the the like the the the, the te same text prompt would pop up again and again. And when it's text, it can do that because it doesn't matter. But as soon as you add a voice to that. Um, it starts to be really annoying um, and it also highlights how bad the writing is because it's like it's vocalized instead of just being information it's like it's now it needs performance but it's not being written with a performance mind da, 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 da. and what I really sort of what was interesting about Little Big Planet was um, it was very clear we had like a lot to do and we had to be really smart about the decisions that we made and for me that was the, one of the things where I just knew that if we added voiceover it would kick off so much work. It was like, and I don't just mean in terms of like the, the, the Sausage Factory production of recording assets. I mean, the realization that we put that in the game and then it would make the game worse. So then we would have to spend a lot of time um, redoing all of that, all of that text and coming up with new systems to make it work. And, da, da, da. <clears throat> and no one was factoring that in when they were making the suggestion to add voice, uh, but I was. Um, and, you know, and I was, I was, I'd only had about four years industry experience at that point, but, you know, I'd had my fellow working with dialogue, particularly as a junior, uh, where you spend much of your life recording and editing dialogue. So I was probably the most experienced person in the team when it came to understanding that uh, all the issues there and, and that workflow and that pipeline. <clears throat> so I was just dead set against it. And we really came to blows about it. I remember really falling out with uh, Siobhan and Alex about it one day where they were just like insistent that we would have voice. Uh, I, I, the argument they, that Siobhan always had was, yeah, but kids can't read, so they won't be able to understand what's going on. And that's that's a bloody good point. <laughs> um, but the, the, the person who made the decision about which way we would go was uh, Mark Healy. Uh, and <laughs> thankfully for, for, for me, um, Mark agreed with, with my take on the fact that, um, yeah, it, it was... Oh, and... The other thing I'm forgetting is that it's, it's really important that when people, yeah, when people come to customize their own levels and they write their own text, that they have a way of making it sort of spoken, if you like. <clears throat> so I think we, yeah, we we had a bit of gibberish in the game. Um, and anyway, it's a controversial subject. And the reality is that it, it's fine to have it the other way if it just has to be done properly. And I, we didn't have time to do that properly. And I don't think we had the skills, experience, the team to do it properly. So I'm glad we basically went the way that we did. Um, it's a strong flavor though, uh, and it's not without its, its problems. Um, but it, as a result of it being a strong flavor, it sort of becomes part of the, the IP. Um, and so in the first game, yeah, the challenge was coming up with unique gibberish voices for each of the different characters and so there's a few different techniques I've got that went there some of the some of the the ones that are original ones that aren't based on sound effects um are they're me so like <laughs> the queen in the in the first in the gardens theme that's me um any of the other sort of more human type ones all me um humpty dumpty in the gardens theme yep that's me um my finest work um, and there's a, there's a whole like, <clears throat> yeah, the, I think the video that you saw on YouTube maybe goes into a bit more detail about the process. I think that was maybe for Little Big Planet 2 specifically because on that project I needed to um, come up with a... <laughs> That's so ridiculous now to think about it. But like, oh, it's so crazy. Um, the things that you end up doing when you make games. Um, because we'd like, on the first game, we'd come up with the whole gibberish thing and for all the reasons I spoke about and all the arguments we had, and we ended up doing what we did. I won, hooray, good, gave me. But it then meant in the second game, because the team were keen to make it more cinematic and add all the like the cinematic tools and the ability to do cutscenes, etc., etc., um, there was much more of a justification and argument for adding voice and recording voice. So 
we added the, the ability to re obviously record into the Magic Mouths. <clears throat> and we very specifically made that the ability to record just onto Magic Mouths and not make it a generic like record object because we wanted to make it like voice centric and to present it in that way so that people wouldn't put the Red Hot Chili Peppers in their, in their levels. Um, you know, there's nothing stopping people from doing that. Um, and, and so that's fine, but it created this weird sort of dichotomy where it's like, okay, we've got voiceover in our, or we've got use of voice and, you know, voice acting in our cinematics. But does that mean we should have, for continuity, we should have voice acting in the game? And <laughs> so, which, like, that's what you, we, we could have done. But again, I was like, but, you know, like, the gibberish is part of, like, Little Big Planet's, like, sound now so we should probably keep gibberish in the in the levels also and again that's where i think i remember bringing out the argument that like the text that the designers were writing just wasn't you know it was fine for information but not great for for reading and, and for for speaking aloud and was keen to keep it as gibberish so which is just like <laughs> it's crazy but it's just kind of where we ended up um and the problem that then created was we needed the the voice actors who were doing the cutscenes needed to do their own gibberish. <laughs> so when we were auditioning everyone for the for that project, at the end of the audition, I would get them to just just test to see if they could do gibberish because it's it's actually really difficult um, to do, and some people can't do it. <clears throat> they just don't have the improv skills to make. To think fast enough to be able to, because the, the challenge is to it's it's very easy to end up repeating yourself and just saying the same sounds over and over. Uh, it's also really easy to do something that just sounds quite offensive um, and makes you sound a bit slow, shall we say? Um, so someone who can say something really articulate but not repeat themselves and not say any actual words, any known words, ideally in any language. That turns out to be really difficult. And for, I, I could do it, which is why I sort of had made that work in the first game, uh, alongside like the more sort of music concrete style sound effects based ones. Like there's a car mechanic in the first game who speaks in like car horn sounds and wrenches and stuff. Um, or like there's the animals that are just like just like bear sounds or or whatever. So like there was some sound effects based stuff. But for the human sort of character ones, yeah, it's it's really hard to do. And so that video you saw on YouTube was kind of about the process of how to. How to, how to do gibberish basically and what went into creating the gibberish for Little Big Planet 2. And the reason I had to come up with a process of sorts was that it, <laughs> all the localized languages in Little Big Planet 2, so obviously we made the game in English, you then get localization agencies to create the German version, the French version, the Spanish version, the Portuguese version, you know, like da, 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 da. And it's like probably like 12 different languages or something crazy like that for a PlayStation game. Um, and yeah, all of the foreign um, actors had to create their own gibberish because we wanted the, their uh, voices to match in the um, in the cutscenes and, and, the, and to match the gibberish in the in the game. So that is just crazy, like that I made people do that, but. Uh, it's just you know you got you got to do you got, you got to do what you got to do. So yeah, I came up with a pipeline that could be explained in a document and saying this is what you need to do. Here's how it works. This is a good example of gibberish. This is a bad example of gibberish. Don't cast people that can't do this because you need it. And anyway, yeah. So it's quite good fun listening to the gibberish in Japanese and, <laughs> and all this. It's just it's just a bit mad. Um. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a whole it's a whole thing with gibberish. It's yeah, it's certainly interesting. Um, <laughs> there are other games that use gibberish. I think the, the most high profile example was probably Simlish, where like they invented a language. Um, and it's interesting the apparently justification for that was to save on budget for localization, which I think is nonsense because EA have loads of money, so that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But also, the whole point of language is if you don't speak it, you don't understand it. So if you just don't want people to who don't speak a language to not understand it, you get that for free by not localizing it. So the whole logic of that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I think it was just a, a fun thing that they, they wanted to, to mess around with. And that's cool. That's 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 as good a justification for doing something as any. Um but for us, yeah, there was you know there were there were reasons 
Um, and that, that's how that's how you create IP. Is like, it's not just about you know artfulness and like <laughs> great creative decision making. It's also just like you got problems to solve, and the way in which you solve them, if you do it in a bold way that sort of um, addresses the problems you've got, but it's just it's really highly flavoured. It becomes part of the identity of the project, and um, yeah, it's it's interesting to think about, look back on after you know fifteen years, uh, some of the decisions that we made for good reasons, but that also now are just sort of part part of it. The the next question on the list is. What's your favourite piece of music to make and why? Good question. Probably, yeah, I mean, yeah, I do, I do really, I love all the music, really, so. But I think the one that, I'm, again, sort of, I don't know if it's my favourite, but the one that I'm proudest of, I think, uh, a bit like with the, the, the prize bubble sounds is the menu music in Little Big Planet 1 just because it's it got, it's quite difficult again to write a bit of music that is going to be heard every time the game boots up uh, and not get <laughs> really annoying uh, but also needs to sort of uh, kind of encapsulate the spirit of Little Big Planet or creativity or something um, and and so that's that's one of the reasons why I decided to write that piece was that I just think that it was I kind of knew I don't know I kind of I don't know if I was necessarily particularly articulate about what it needed, but I was um, certainly had a feeling of what it needed to be, um, and so that's why I don't think I could necessarily communicate to Matt what he needed to do to make that work. And so rather than put us both through that painful process, which probably would involve me saying a bunch of stuff that didn't make any sense and then him writing a bunch of stuff which didn't work <laughs> as a result of that poor direction, I decided to just do it myself. Uh, and I didn't know if what I was doing was going to necessarily end up being the final thing. It was. It started out just as a, right, let's just see where this goes. But fortunately, I ended up working and feeling appropriate. Um, and... Yeah, it's kind of. I think the reason it worked is it's a little bit melancholy. The certainly the when you're on the craft earth, uh, which we never referred to as Little Big Planet. Weirdly, we also heard it as the craft earth. <laughs> um, I guess we thought of Little Big Planet as the whole project, whereas the craft earth was like a little thing. It's, which doesn't make any sense, does it? Um, but the so the music's on there. Yeah, it's a little bit melancholy. Um, and then, but you got the moon, and so the interactivity when you switch from the earth to the moon. Or what's it? What's the other one? The other planet? Uh, the, uh, the world one? No, there's three. What's the other one? Uh, there's the moon. Is it the community? I can't remember. There's another bit. Early in development, it used to be called the the info fridge. Uh, there used to be a fridge with like post-it notes on it, <laughs> um, which we got rid of because it made no sense. Which is a shame because I quite liked how random it was. But I think that that got changed to be. I think there's a little another moon which is just like community stuff or online information i can't remember what it's called but it's got its own, again it's got its own little music stem uh, and so yeah just getting all that to work and have the music switch between it uh, depending on the context that was all nice i uh, enjoyed getting that to work and it added a lot to the menu made it feel special um and again i think that's a challenge working on the sequel it's like you got something like that you want to sort of redo it and make it fresh but you're kind of stuck with the fact that you made something that worked really well the first time and so you can only make something that's not not is not quite as good and so i was never quite as happy with the main music that we planet 2 because it was sort of the same but made a bit more digital to fit with little planet 2's aesthetic but that didn't quite work but there wasn't really any other option uh that i could see so yeah it just yeah i wasn't wasn't as happy with that but overall yeah i'd say that's my my favorite bit of music or the one i'm most proud of that's uh yeah i i'll be honest i never really listened to the pod theme as as normally in a level somewhere exactly but i mean it's the kind of thing where it just sort of most people would pass through it and just sort of on their way um but some people would hang out in their pods with 
other players in chat. <laughs> Uh, but that was a nice thing. Like we had the ability, if you closed the menu right down, and you were just in the pod. There was no music, um, and again, that was intentional so that uh, music would build as you go through the menu system, but also that you had the option effectively to sort of turn it off without having to go into menu and turn it off. Um, yeah, so there's you know lots of little design decisions uh, behind that. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of a lot of thought and planning going into the game. What is your least favorite piece of music that you had to make, and why? Um, blah, 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 blah. I don't think I've got an answer to that one, to be honest. Um, which piece do I hate? <laughs> like I said before, like there's not any piece where I'm just like, wish it hadn't gone in, or like, ah. I think in general, like, I mean, I wasn't, um, wasn't actually hired to write music for the game I was responsible for making sure that the game had amazing audio um so a lot of that music because I wasn't very experienced at writing music at that point a lot of it's the production is quite naive and so I'm a bit embarrassed now listen back to it about some of the production uh I mean yeah, it's still good I'm still good at what I do and I was you know like it was fine because as a sound designer I had decent production chops but uh, you know I would just I would I would just do it a lot differently if I, I did it now I yeah I listen back to them it's like a bit cringe but I'm not it was the best I could do at the time so I'm not ashamed of it um uh but yeah I don't think I don't think yeah I don't I'm, I'm going to decline to answer that one that's, that's <laughs> fair enough yeah there's not yeah because there's just genuinely not anything where I'm just like I wish we hadn't done that I wish that wasn't in there um I wish we had more music um that's one of the reasons why we licensed a bunch of stuff from Daniel was um it was Daniel's suggestion actually like um he was just chanting his arm like he'd written the, the intro movie music and was like oh by the way I've got all this stuff that I own if you want to license it for cheap then go for it um I don't know if he had cunningly in the back of his mind at that point the thought that, he, that this was a high profile project and he would release uh an album <laughs> after the fact to try and get some more money out of it. I don't know, but um yeah, he licensed this this stuff for 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 for, for you know a really a really good rate. And that allowed us to um because we I definitely had the feeling towards the end of the development that we just didn't have quite enough music in there. We were reusing a lot of stuff across the board. Um and getting I can't remember how many tracks someone can can, can work it out how many tracks we got from Daniel, but you know it was like somewhere between you know four or five, six, something like that. And that just created a little bit more variety uh, for the experience, and that, that really helped. So that was a big win, because right at the point where we didn't have time to write anymore, uh, it was really just the last few weeks of development where we sort of had that epiphany, uh, and that worked out really well. But yeah, not, there's, there's nothing in the game that I'm just like horrified by. Fairly long question, but uh, when you were approached to do the music for the game, what was the game like, and how did you feel about it if you knew much about the game? Like I mentioned in the last answer, the last question, I wasn't hired to write the music, even though I ended up writing a bunch of it. Um, so that sort of just sort of happened. I'll speak a bit more about that. But so, but the point I joined the project, it was like it was May two thousand and seven. So I actually I, I was working at Sony's London studio at that point. Um, and my 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 girlfriend now wife at the time she was up in edinburgh and i was looking to leave sony and try and get a job in scotland <clears throat> which is where i am now I, i'm freelance now and i moved back from the southeast of england about a couple of years ago um and yeah couldn't get a job in scotland and but was trying to get one and so I was looking to leave Sony. It was a great place to work. It's not because I necessarily was like super unhappy there. Uh, although, you know, like, like all, like all, when everyone, when anyone leaves a job, there's, all, there's always reasons why. But for the most part, it was, uh, at least what it to be with Nicola. Was, we were both a bit tired of uh, that long distance relationship, to be honest. So it was sort of make or break time. And, um, and then this job at Media Molecule came up, which was a bit of a span in the works as far as uh, Nicola and I's relationship, because, but, they, they, when Little Big Planet was announced at the Game Developers Conference in uh, that would be where, 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 where. yeah March two thousand and seven, um, and Media Monk had been going for about a year at that point, something like that. Little Little Big Planet was just 
amazing. It got such a great reception because it was just a really refreshing, cool little project, you know. Um, and I just really wanted to work in it, <laughs> basically. And interesting, I because because I've been looking for jobs, I'd seen the Media Molecule job, but like they were not, you know, Little Big Planet wasn't announced. They just they had a really cool website, but. I didn't look at it and go, wow, I need to work with these people. I was just like, well, who are they? Like, you know, that's why they found hiring a lot easier once the project was announced. And I'm one of the people that joined the company um, after that point. But yeah, I, I, I didn't just want to work on the project because it was cool. I also just felt a really strong affinity with it and felt like I got it and that I, um, yeah, could could sort of help them basically make something special. And I also, like as part of my the job application process, I actually wrote an, uh, like an audio design document, more probably from the technical side of things than necessarily from aesthetics and the, sort of the, the, the way the game would sound, um, which is a tricky one to articulate. I think it's hard to articulate now, never mind at the time before I even started working on it, but um, just in terms of what they could do with technology and what features there could be, I basically sort of had, and that, that's actually pretty much what we shipped. So I had a really good idea of what the project needed before I even started working on it. Because I was just like, well, they're doing user-generated content, then here's your options, this is what you could do, but that one looks a bit esoteric, so you went to this, da, 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 da. and I sort of presented all that as part of my job application, which I'm sure sort of helped persuade them that I was the right person for the job. Because yeah, again, I wasn't super experienced at that point. I had about three and a half, four years industry experience. Um, it's better than nothing, but it's also, it's not like someone super experienced did sort of handle such an important part of the, the project. Um, so I was really lucky to get the job, but fortunately they were really lucky to get me too. So <laughs> it all worked out. Um, but yeah, it, so it was early days in the project. The interesting thing about the GDC announcement was that it looked to all intents and purposes that they were like they were nearly finished because it was such a slick presentation and it looked great and da, 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 da. actually now that i uh you know i can tell you from from behind the curtain that when media molecules show stuff and um, what they're showing you is literally uh their best stuff and is not representative of <laughs> of what else is going on they're just very good at presenting well um and it was always interesting to be sort of to know that and to look back at the GDC demo, because everyone's always like, you must be finished soon, right? You know, like, it's, like it looks great. When's it going to be done? And we spent another, you know, from that point on, it was another 18 months working on the thing. Um, So yeah, it was interesting joining the company and seeing that, yeah, they just didn't actually have that much. <laughs> there was like, in terms of like polished levels, there was what they showed at GDC and there was like one or two other super polished, like, shippable quality levels but there really was nothing else and you know and half the half the tools weren't there yet uh, and a lot of the, the the content was actually being made in a pc editor not using the the, the, the dualshock controller uh, dualshock is that right yeah is that, is, I, is I that ps4 so, yeah. PS3? I... can't remember it's a long time ago maybe single shock I can't okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not 100 sure myself Dual shock three oh, who knows just up two uh, anyway um it was yeah so there was like it was just yeah it was yeah it, but it was an amazing project to work on um it was it, more so than any, any other project before or since it was easy is not the right word because it was a boatload of hard work but it, i think it was just very clear what needed to be done from my perspective, which is partly down to, you know, good direction coming from the, the other directors and senior creatives on the team. But also, yeah, the project, it, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it was. There was just something in the water that just made it, from my perspective, quite clear what needed to be done. And the only challenges that I had really was getting the resources I needed to then actually do that. Um, and there were some challenges there, particularly working with a small startup company without loads of budget or not willing to spend the budget, etc. Um, but yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was great. I loved it. It was, it was good that it was successful. <laughs>
yeah, I, I, I'm pretty happy that it's successful because it then meant a little bit of Planet 2 could be made. Yeah, which if, if that one's your favourite, I think I can, I can get that. I think the interesting thing I remember when I was still at Media Molecule, there was, I don't know, for some reason people were playing a little bit of Planet 2 on, on the telly in one of the communal areas um, years after it came out, but it just looked amazing. It's an amazing looking game. Um, even now it still stands up. Uh, it's a really beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, so yeah, we're all, we're all we're all super proud proud of the of the projects. And it's great that it's still because um, there's a lot of people who obviously grew up playing the games. Um, folk like yourself, oh, my, my, myself, absolutely. Um, some folk older than you, some probably not too many, too much younger. Because again, it's like 15 years ago the first one came out. So <laughs> it's like like that's a long, that's an almost an adult age right there. I, I'm not, there weren't probably weren't too many people playing at the age of three, but yeah, people in their early 20s and stuff who were playing it when they were quite young uh yeah that's that's a thing so there's, there's there's this huge fan of huge group of sort of fans that are still out there reminiscing <laughs> about their childhood but that's interesting like that i feel like that sort of first full circle thing is something that it still touches my work now because working on the um the astrobot games with sony japan studio um like certainly, you know, like Astro's Playroom, um, that was a project which, uh, had, yes, big on nostalgia and being able to sort of key into that um, is something that really started for me on on Little Big Planet because because of its handmade aesthetic, there was a big part of it well, from the audio point of view was trying to make it sound a bit like a yeah sort of nineteen seventies BBC. Uh, kids TV show so that, that's where the like the retro aesthetic comes from it's sort of this warm fuzzy kind of a Gen X thing so it's kind of ironic like we were making that game for ourselves but the fact that it resonated with uh, young folk who were you know 20 years younger than us or whatever uh, is interesting because it just sort of shows that those things are, are universal but that's uh, it's a big part of what I do now is um, retro Retro aesthetics. I, I love old stuff. Old stuff is cool. Well, funny you, you mentioned about the uh, about the dialogue writing. I yeah. I spoke to uh, I spoke to Dean Wilkson. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, last how well, many other days ago it was Monday, I think <laughs> Monday night. Um, but yeah, uh, he's the he's the only other person who actually got back to me. Okay. Um, yeah, because we, we 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 hooked up with Dean through Side. So Side was the recording company in Soho that we used to record um, at Media Ball, all of our voiceovers. So, but obviously in the first project that would be Stephen Fry. Um, and I don't know if they still have this setup, but back then they had a sort of a side hustle called Side Lines, which was an agency to hire writers through, and that's how we. Um, uh, ended up working with Dean, and, and Dean had a bunch of experience as a as a uh, for writing for kids TV, and so we felt like th that he might be a good match um, for the project. And he did a great job. Like he's the one who came up with all the made up words uh, <laughs> in the intro movie. Um, and actually, I can't. It was interesting. Actually, the intro movie is an interesting one because um, so Rex Crowell, who was. Uh, I think he's probably credited as one of the artists in the project, but he was also um, one of the main people responsible for the conceptual side of the project in terms of like, what is Little Big Planet? Where is it? Uh, and then sort of articulating the, these ideas. And then um, Rex was responsible for putting together the intro movie. So, you know, he's the one who, he came up with the concept for it all and, you know, helped, uh, worked with, again, with an agency to put together the crew for filming everyone and all the rest of it. And so he conceived of it all, and um, Rex didn't want any voiceover in the intro movie because he sort of made it without that in mind, which is fair enough. Um, but and Dean wrote um, some like some, some a script or like some some words for the for for the intro based off of Rex's brief. Um, and I think we ended up, it was a little bit too wordy. I think we ended up cutting it down or recording it and then editing bits out to make it fit because it was just uh, <laughs> too much, too much, too much wordage in there. Um, 
And at Rex was really worried. He was like, I don't want this. But like the reason I persuaded them to let us even just try to do it was that my main concern, and this is so this is one of the things that I brought to the table at Mean Molecule that, that no one else really had much talent or experience for was uh, these kind of moment to moment things, oh, mainly in, in audio, but thinking about the bigger picture was I knew that if we didn't have any Stephen Fry voiceover in the intro movie, that the first time you hear his voice would be when you're in the, the intro level and he says, you know, on the little big planet, your little sack person, this one is you. Oh, how cute, I think is, is what he says. Um, and that to have Stephen Fry just suddenly start to speak at you at that point is a bit odd because his character, if you like, as the, the voice of Little Big Planet hadn't been introduced. So to just have it appear out of nowhere without introducing him is weird. Like, it's, that's the kind of shit that games do all the time because they don't think about these things. But, like, you know, I've got that that interest in that background and use of voice. So um, I thought it was really important that we have Stephen Fry's voice on the intro movie. And technically it's the same problem. He just starts speaking out of nowhere. However, because it's an intro movie and it's basically an advert, <laughs> That's a context that people are used to uh, having a narrator in. So it's not as rude an introduction for the voice to start. And so by having it in the intro movie, when he then speaks to you in the first level, it doesn't come across as a surprise. It actually helps to create continuity from this person who's introduced the project to then telling you about it in the, in the first level. And so, so that's the reason why I was keen to have it in there because it would act as a, a segue basically between the intro and the first level. Uh, unfortunately, with Dean's uh, nice uh, writing and all the uh, Imagisphere and all the other nonsense that he came up with for the for the intro movie, um, once we got you know recorded Stephen and um, yeah edited it down, made it fit the the image with Daniel's amazing uh, Orbit Dreamers um, music track. Uh, yeah, it all just came together, and so it's difficult to sort of imagine it any other way now. Um, but yeah, again, a really nice example of collaboration because there's lots of different moving parts there, um, all mainly driven by Rex, but it's like, um, yeah, it, it took people with <laughs> a bunch of different opinions to like weigh in and try stuff. And yeah, it was, yeah, the end result is again, something just is just like great uh, and something to be really proud of. There's, actually, there's sound effects in the intro movie which are like super quiet that um again i don't think anyone will have noticed because like it's mainly just like music and voiceover with, with the visuals but there's some like super verbed out um sound effects in a few places which again the reason they're verbed out is because when they were really concrete and in your face it just sort of was distracting and didn't work so i had to sort of find a way to sort of just put them in there. They're basically not there. So I don't know if you can actually even hear them particularly, but I could probably hear them because I I kind of I put them there. Uh so there's another little little test for people if they want to think if they can hear anything. Um but yeah so the final question was um so we didn't I hey this kind of came up slightly in conversation earlier but like it wasn't up at all um, and i remember thinking that I'll, I'll bring this up later um and i'll actually get to the question now <laughs> 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 what was uh what's the process of making the making own music a little bit plant too so there's the whole oh, yeah. sequence bar for, for making your own music yeah so like yeah like i mentioned earlier that was one of the things that we would have loved to put into the first game but there just wasn't time to do that and truth be told they're they're really almost wasn't time to do it in the second game um on the second game i mean from my perspective the set the second game was an exercise in changing stuff for the sake of changing it which again i go back to that conversation about sequels it's like well we need to make it different because if it's not different it feels like we're ripping people off and da, da, da. so you end up just changing stuff for the sake of changing it and some of the stuff we changed was just like a waste of everyone's time like <laughs> the stuff we added like um uh animated backgrounds so like rather than i think there might have been some limited movement in the background no i don't think there was actually yeah so i think the backgrounds were static and a little big plant there might be maybe there'd been a little bit of wind simulation on some of the like plants or whatever but basically there were static backgrounds um little big plant 2 we had the ability for there to be like animation so there was like stuff moving 
And again, that was just to make it more visually interesting, but really it was a whole bunch of work. And then it caused the problem of having the need to add sound to that. So there was all, lots of little decisions like that where I was just like, oh, why, why? Taking up sort of time doing stuff, which ultimately didn't matter. And it ended up causing more problems than it was worth, to be honest. So there's things like that, which just sort of drove me nuts. And then that was frustrating because there's things like, you know, like looking at the big picture, what's one of the biggest features that we really need that we don't have? It's like the ability of people to add their own music. And so to be spending time working on stuff which wasn't needed when we weren't spending time working on stuff that was, you know, indisputably much more important, it's incredibly frustrating. And I remember being absolutely livid <laughs> about the fact that we hadn't added any new audio features to Little Big Planet 2, none. Um, there was new content, obviously, but there was no new features for people to use. Um, and just being like, this is rubbish, um, basically. Um, and I think, I think it was maybe only the second time I'd like threatened to quit <laughs> was um, over that. The first one was actually, I think it was after that conversation with Alex and Siobhan about gibberish in the first game, because they'd sort of decided without me that they, they were going to have voiceover. And I was like, you can't do that. I'm out here. If, if, you, if, you, if, that's, if that's what it's going to be, I'm out here. Uh, it was a bit uh, melodramatic, but um, it was something that was very important to me at the time. And then you know, on Planet 2, it was like, if we don't add this, I'm out here because this is bullshit. Uh, and bless him. Because um, Alex is a very talented audio programmer. I think the first job he had in the industry back in the day at Bullfrog was was doing audio coding. Um, and it's something he really cares about. Like Alex was a, a yeah, just involved with music and the demo scene and, and all sorts. So it's something he's passionate about and experienced with. But he didn't do any uh, audio coding on the first project. That was all Matt Willis. Um, and so in Liquid Planet 2, it was great. I actually got a couple of weeks of Alex's time to do the, what was it? What was like a, a prototype on a PC of the music sequencer. And that came off the back of me, like, just like, again, throwing my toes at the pram and being like, if we don't have this, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna leave because this is bullshit. Uh, and I, and I, the reason Alex did that wasn't just because I was being a drama queen. It was also because he knew that I was right and that the project really needed this. Um, so so we worked together on that. Um, mainly Alex, obviously doing all the coding, um, and then but me helping him feedback on the features and how it should work and the user interface and all that. <clears throat> and the coolest feature I think was. Um, Alex's decision to allow you to like draw in the bends on the notes by having diagonal, like a start point and an end point for notes, and you could have a bend. Um, and that's cool. It's not something I've seen uh, <laughs> before or since. Um, so it's a really nice little feature. Uh, and yeah, that's that's that was the nice thing about working with Alex is that he does like to just sort of he's not he's not constrained by how things are done. He just likes to sort of look at things a bit differently. Um, so that was great. It was a um, really productive couple of weeks. But then the problem was that, that was, that's all I got of Alex's time. And that was a PC prototype, so it wasn't in the game. Um, and there was the real thorny issue was, um, okay, so we had basically some template code then for, how, for a synthesizer for uh, being able to render the audio. The issue was actually getting that user interface into the game because that's not a trivial task there was nothing equivalent to that already in the project and no one was prepared to do the work to uh, to make that happen because it was just like no one cared enough about it fortunately um we recognized that there were strong parallels between the time-based nature of the music sequencer and the fact that the cinematics team also really needed a sequencer to time all their events because up until that point i think they'd just been doing stuff with like little timers and triggering stuff and it just mean, meant changing stuff was a nightmare and everything broke and it was uh yeah it was really bad so they really needed basically a, a timeline sequencer to trigger events and uh dave smith took on the work of making sure that as he was writing the uh the timeline tool that it would also be compatible uh with with music so it's at some level in underlying code they're basically the same thing um, and of course, I think I think in Little Big Planet Two, you can you can put uh, trigger logic objects on the music sequencer because they're basically the same thing. So, um, 
And then Matt Willis, the audio programmer, actually took Alex's uh, code from the PC prototype for the uh, music editor and made that work under the hood on the PlayStation 3. Um, yeah, and so again, team effort and, you know, no one person sort of made that happen. It was uh, me and Alex and then Matt and Dave, and then obviously a bunch of uh, polish and iteration that goes on. And then having to actually create all the musical instruments, which is the, like where the work for me really was uh, cut out. And there were a whole bunch of features there which we played with in the PC prototype that didn't make it in. I remember there was an arpeggiator. Um, and actually there was there was features that made it in which I think were not necessary. Like Alex was really keen on having um, the ability to tag all your music segments with what key they were written in. So if you were to transpose the key of your piece, that would all magically work. But the big flaw there being that why on earth would anyone tag their stuff with the core, the key it was written in? Like that's not <laughs> that's not a thing that people do. So it was like one of those good ideas on paper, but didn't have any legs. Uh, and so I I'd be, I would love to know if anyone used that feature. I'd love to know because I'm pretty sure no one did. Then I can rub that in Alex's face. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it was it was cool and it's been so nice to um just see the stuff that because we like it's one of those things where it's just such a no-brainer we knew that people would do yeah people would do it, make it use it to make covers of like mario and final fantasy 7 and blah 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 like that was that was inevitable but just knowing that there are people who, who um you know learn to write music in little big planet too is super cool and you know and people still get in touch to sort of be like oh thank you uh, <laughs> for that um and yeah, that we kind of knew that that would happen. That's one of those inevitable things when you've got a project that's going to be played by, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of people, and it's got a creative tool in it, like a music tool. Then some that will end up being a profound experience for a really small percentage of some of those people. But so we just kind of knew that that would happen, and it, 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 yeah, it was sort of nice to know working on it that it would have that that role for for people. Um, and it's also great to see, obviously, the amazing creative tools that. Uh, Media Molecule have gone on to make in Dreams, which is sort of, you know, it's based off the back of the experience of, of, of making that and seeing it be successful on a big planet and wanting to, you know, take it to the next level uh, with all the amazing uh, additional features and interactivity and uh, cross-pollination you can have between uh, music and, yeah, gameplay and lighting and everything else that you can do in, in Dreams. It's amazing. Um, so, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, that was, that, that, that was, that was the yeah. It was the most important, or one of the few audio features added for Little Planet Two, uh, and it was the most important one. Uh, and yeah, I'm again just really, really, really pleased and proud that we managed to to get that in there because it very nearly didn't happen. Yeah, I, I say, I'm glad it happened. It's like I I never really did it myself. I think I made one or two pieces from what I can remember. They were they were terrible. It's. Uh... <laughs> But um, it's like, yeah, it, I think once again, like uh, you, like you said earlier about how you guys could create music, but like or like you said earlier about how with our voices, you guys could have voices, but the community couldn't have voices. Yeah. This was once again something that you guys could create music, but the community couldn't. Yeah, I think the only regret was that we didn't um, have enough time. The music sensor came on quite late in the day and we didn't actually have time to write that much music with it for the project so the only bit of music that i wrote using it is uh, in the intro level i did an arrangement of the left bank do left bank two track which is the uh bit of library music that plays in the intro level in the planet one i did a a, a little sort of little planet two music sequencer arrangement of that it was just fun because it's like you know it's a little jazzy number so it was uh fun trying to work out what the <laughs> what the chords are uh, in there um but yeah, that, that, that was the only thing that I did, and all the other tracks, uh, sequencer tracks that are in the Little Planet 2 were done by Bayon. Um, and, and he created his own samples for that and stuff, uh, which is cool. Um, but I wish more of the music in the Little Planet 2 had been uh, written in the sequencer, not just so it would have, like, you know, been a bit more of a holistic sort of. Uh, experience but also using the sequencer more would have helped iterate on it better and made it uh, i don't think it was particularly buggy i think it was pretty robust but i think we you know if we'd been able to use it in anger a bit more probably would have been able to help to refine the workflow of using it 
a bit more because it was a little bit rough and ready, but uh, you know, it worked. <laughs> definitely, yeah, it definitely, definitely worked well. Um, also, going back to the left bank too, um, you said about uh, so the that's in the yeah, that's in the first level, the opening. Yeah. So did you like later on once the game was made and stuff? Did you then go back and make it on the sequencer or well? What no, 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 no. That so the, the, what you hear in Little Big Planet Two in the intro is uh, running in real time on the Little Big Planet Two um, music sequencer, and I did that. That's the only thing I had time to do for Little Big Planet Two using the sequencer. So yeah, I mean, I, yeah, that was done. Yeah, that wasn't added later. That's that's in there. That's um, yeah. That, that's that, I I don't know. That's kind of a yeah, fairly amazing. It's so like that's always always one of my favourite pieces in Little Bit Plan too. We have left bank to uh, eight cool. bit pieces of music, but knowing that so was I don't made in a know if cool. the track is was available. I don't think we gave it away as an object for you to be able to place down in the levels. Um, like it's not a collectible, so you only ever heard it. I think in the. I think I'm right. I might be wrong. Not sure. I yeah, I'm I'm thinking back to it now, and yeah, possibly, quite possibly, yeah, I think so. But yeah, I, I don't know. The fact uh, knowing that that was made on the uh, on the sequencer, um, just kind of uh, yeah, really really hits home. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I guess you know we didn't. The fact that we didn't give it away meant that people couldn't. Well, that we, I think the reason we didn't give it away was people would then be able to edit it, and then that puts us in a difficult position because we've licensed that track, and we wouldn't want people to mess with the licensed track. So that's probably why we didn't do that. But yeah, that's also where mind some people wouldn't understand that it's done on the sequencer. They maybe just thought it was like a cute eight-bit version, which it is, but it's running in real time, which is cool. <laughs> that is really cool to be fair. But yeah. Um... I'll, uh, I'll let you head off and finish via the rabbit cage. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, ra rabbit proofing the fencing. So, I mean, you can view our garden as a giant rabbit cage if you like, but the idea is to keep the rabbits out. I, I think I'll stay in the little bit of Planet Gardens. Yay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see you did there. Good. But yeah, All right, cool. Um, nice to meet you, John. Thank you very much for that. I really, really do appreciate that. And don't put that in the video, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs>